Here we go. Hello everyone, welcome to the Jenkins Infrastructure Weekly Team Meeting. We are the 3rd of May 2022. So today we have Mark Witt is not there, so we have Stéphane, Stéphane Merle. We have Basil. Is is your name Crow? I am pronouncing it correctly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Basil okay. Crow. Ba Basil Crow. Okay. I, I, I'm still having issues to have the correct intonation for Basil. No but worries. I, I'm really sorry if I if I, uh, I I'll try my best. And we have one or two D to pudding, Bruno. Two D, please. Bruno Verharten. Okay, we have Bruno Verharten, Damien Duportal, Stéphane Merle, and Basil. Uh, Hervé is off, and Mark won't be able to join. Uh, first of all, announcement. So today is the day of the weekly release. Uh, the weekly release failed to happen because we have an Azure service credential that expired a few days ago, four or five days ago. Uh, and it failed well, because that credential is required to retrieve the GPG key used to sign the packages. I don't know the exact, uh, I'm not at, at ease with the release process on that area. I don't know because there is a, there might be issue if the release has been already performed by Maven, hence the meta that have been pushed to Gifrog Artifactory. As I remember, once performed, it download then the WAR, sign it and upload it again. But my memory might betray me. So I haven't spent too much time. I just saw that just before this meeting. So I don't know. It has to be diagnosed. An issue has been opened on the help desk and the uh, team and Mark have been pinged on that area. So uh, we'll delegate that part to them. If they are not able to fix it until tomorrow, then we will take over and trigger a new release tomorrow morning. But the risk is that the new release might have an incremented version number that could be the 347 instead. So ideally we should avoid jumping one version, but if they cannot and they are not available, we trigger a new one and that's not not that much an issue, but always better. Um, failed because expired credential. Um, LTS baseline selection. Uh, for so that one, I, I let you type. I don't know which typing is it you, Stefan? It, it's me. I oh, tried okay. to help you. But... Okay, nice. Uh, so let's get started on other announcement, unless you have some. Okay, so then let's proceed. Um, a quick note on what you see on the screen, the task that we were able to finish uh, successfully during that the past milestone. So we were able to fix the missing ARM and CPUZ images. Um, we didn't fix the SSO for crowding Jenkins IO. As discussed last week, the decision, uh, the collegial decision was we don't want to connect the new service crowding Jenkins IO to the actual LDAP. So that might be GitHub SSO, and that's another area because we, Jenkins infrastructure team, are not admin of the Jenkins CI organization on GitHub. And it has been closed as one fix. Uh, we were able to finish the upgrade campaign for Kubernetes 1.21. So that happened last Wednesday on the AKS cluster that were the two missing clusters. Uh, outage of two minutes of, for the LDAP because it's not highly available. That's an LDAP. Uh, time for the pod to restart on the new machine. Uh, we were able to upgrade all the Adoptium GDK 17 and 11. We have an issue for tracking the 17, while the 11 was done automatically by the update CLI. So we didn't create it an issue just for that. 
but the GDK 17 was fixing uh, severity. That's why uh, we created an issue. Uh, these versions are now available on all the CI Jenkins IO agents and also on the tools of the CI Jenkins IO system. If there is an issue, please open an help desk. We can totally roll back the virtual machine and or container templates. We also had an issue with the web UI on GFrog Artifactory. The web UI wasn't available while the Artifactory was still uh, okay. Um, so uh, we contacted GFrog who fixed the issue. However, that on the line, we are missing a monitoring element. We need to add a new web UI probe. So a new issue has been created to tackle down because we were only monitoring the backend system that may even use for downloading or uploading artifacts. But still, the web UI provides an user feature. Some end users want to search the artifacts. They need the web UI and they need to be able to log through that service. So we need to monitor that so we can avoid having the service being down for at least three days. So thanks for all the users who were patient enough and let us know. Uh, so that's clearly an improvement area for us because we were really bad on that area. Finally, we were able to finish and close the issue regarding Docker Hub credentials. So now all the controllers have their own set of credentials and we have split pull and push to increase the security of all the Docker Hub accounts. We have another issue ongoing about being onboarded on the Docker open source program that will increase the rate limit of our container. They accept it and now they are doing technical stuff, they should come back to us, but they are still quite busy. Um, so thanks, Stefan, for doing the heavy lifting on the pipeline library there. And we documented all the accounts, which was an information missing a lot. That documentation is not public. Uh, that should be, but we weren't uh, focused on public or private. We were, fo we were focused on writing it somewhere. And then we can decide if we move it to public, private in the second step. Now on the work in progress element, um, I propose to start with the CI Jenkins IO outages. So initially we had container agent in a degraded state. That was an issue that uh, basically opened uh, 12 days ago, if I'm not mistaken. We have a post-mortem to run on that area. Um, I've proposed a date time Wednesday, so tomorrow. I don't know if it's if it fits your schedule, folks. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, cool. Um, Maybe late for me. Yes, because end of day and yeah, Wednesday afternoon for the kiddos. Yes. Uh, Mark answered, and I don't know for Hervé, but Hervé is back. Uh, yes, back home. Yes, uh, tomorrow. Uh, that will be recorded. Uh, we will take public notes and put the notes back on the public issue. Um, also, there has been an issue on CI Jenkins IO cooked by at least uh, Mark and a few other persons during the weekend. So it was night, week, uh, night for the European, so most of the US people were affected while the European were sleeping. Um, and last night also, so yesterday for uh, our American friends, there has been an issue. So thanks, Basil, for jumping on that uh, with Mark. It appeared that you were able to take some flame graph and started some diagnosis. Um, so that makes it a top priority now to focus on CI Jenkins IO in the upcoming weeks. And one of the first tasks we need to grant you access, Basil, as we said last week, but uh, I'm the culprit, I was late this week, so sorry for that. But we need to grant you access on that area. Yeah, so. Sure. Yeah, to, to summarize what Mark and I looked at yesterday, the CPU was saturated on all cores of this controller. And when we looked at the flame graph, we saw something unexpected, which was that the JVM was spending a lot of time doing compilation of bytecode into native code. Oh. About 30% 30, 30 of the CPU time during a two minute sample that we took. And then during the rest of that time, it was executing Java code, mostly either Git cloning of pipeline shared libraries or 
compilation of those pipeline shared libraries. Now, whether or not the, and by compilation, I mean uh, the groovy Java code that that compiles the, the pipeline shared libraries and parses the abstract syntax tree, et cetera. So whether or not that groovy compilation was related to the hotspot compilation, uh, I'm not completely sure, but it's possible that they're related. And in any case, the Git cloning was about one third of the CPU time. Um, and as far as I could tell, the memory usage looked pretty good. So the only problem I could see was that the CPU was saturated and it was almost exclusively doing something with pipeline shared libraries. So that's all that we were able to determine in the um, hour or so that we spent looking at this. We did capture a flame graph, a thread dump and a heap dump, which I think should be part of the runbook for any incident. And I can't remember if we captured the Jenkins logs, but I hope we did. And if not, then we should have. Yep, good point. Um, I had a question on that area that might or might not be related, but yesterday we did a change on the shared library configuration. Um, we added uh, an exclusion to the caching rule because the system is expected to cache the shared library. So that's why the git clone part for the, I'm not sure if I understand correctly. Do you remember if it was git clone of shared library itself or git clone of the repository? Of the repositories uh, being built by the projects. Oh, it was the, it was a clone of the shared library. So, I wonder then if the change that we did could not be related. Um, let me get the issue there, if I can remember it. Um, so, oh no, it was on Jenkins Infra. So what we did uh, is that we were working with uh, Stefan on trying to test on real life. Uh, before merging a pull request on the pipeline library. And after running the unit test and running some end to end test on our area, we wanted to run it on CI Jenkins IO in real life. In order to do that, we had it on the top of the pipeline, the annotation at library, pointing to the git reference of the pull request, pull slash number of the pull request slash head. We do that usually, except uh, since it cached on CI Jenkins IO. We added the temporary exception that then we persisted on the inf uh, configuration as code. For every branch's name in pool slash something, then they should not be cached because it's only a few jobs and only a few edge cases. That's a change we did yesterday, but since it's on the same area, I wonder if it could or could not uh, be related. I have no proof of both sides, but that's a change that happened on the system uh, so that's why I'm mentioning it uh, on the audit log there. Yeah, I think this caching feature is relatively new. So um, there may be some edge cases or some bugs that have not been fully resolved yet in this caching implementation. Mm -hmm. um, there has been a discussion on the closed pull request. So I, let me add the link. I'm adding the link on the issue. Might or might not be related. So it appeared that Jesse Glick and Tim Yacomb uh, told us on after it was released, since I mentioned that one, that we shouldn't have had the issue that require us to exclude the pool slash, because it looks like that the feature is always trying to get the latest reference and then it's only the git clone step, which is expected to be cached or not. So in our case, since we push new commit to the pipeline library in the pull request, the system should have detected the new commit and said, okay, it's a new one, I should clone it, which definitively did not happen. We were always uh, using the initial test with it, even if we were pushing uh, changes. So that's the reason initially why we added the exception. Um, I'm not sure if as a safety feature, we should maybe roll back that one. I'm not sure. How do you feel about that, folks? Because I don't have any facts that could let me know that's the problem, so let's roll back. But since it's the same area, gut feeling. No, I would so keep it uh, just to make sure it's coming from here. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's good to do some analysis, like you said, and I'm planning to look into the flame graph a little more closely and see if I can come to any conclusions. Um, okay. But the, the, the comment that was made about the caching should the about how the caching should have done this item should have not forced you to uh, make this manual change in the first place. I think that's a legitimate comment. Um, it does sound like a bug in this caching feature if it didn't work in this use case out of the box. Um, so I, I would I would encourage you to raise that bug with the um, the maintainers of the the pipeline share the pipeline shared libraries plugin. And I think the best way to do that would be to, if you could, if you could come up with a simple reproducible test case and file a JIRA ticket, that would be the best way to start. And, and that 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 list of steps to reproduce could then be turned into an integration test. And that would be the first part of the process toward fixing the bug in the pipeline shared libraries plugin. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if that can be shown in in a set of manual steps and later on in an integration test, then fixing the problem would be the logical step after that. And that's something that we could take to the pipeline maintainers or even the person who added the caching feature um, because they might not be aware of this particular deficiency. But if we can show them with a ticket and a set of steps to reproduce, then that might be good, a good way to motivate a fix for this problem. Yeah, I agree on that part. Uh, that that's a matter of finding a reproduction case. Uh, my personal uh, measurement when it comes to Jenkins is that it takes me two hours to find a representation case if it's only one line of pipeline. That's the amount of time that it takes me. So uh, I'm totally willing to do that, and we agree that it helps. But that's always the, I always have mixed feeling about asking user for reproduction case because it's not always easy. So that's a, a time investment. We do this because we are the Jenkins community, so no problem. But yeah, that's that might be hard for other kind of users. Yeah, I mean, it's, always better, it's always better to collect all of the state for post-mortem analysis yep. at the time of failure. Um, and I don't, I don't think we do a great job of that overall in the Jenkins project. I think that's something we could we could improve on in, in a wide variety of areas. Mm -hmm. In this in this case, the, the the way to reproduce this sounds like you would need a, an already cached shared library, and then you would need to make an update and a pull request and demonstrate that the cached version is used rather than it's, it's more than that. You you have to to have a pull request of a pipeline library that and that pull request is already in cached. And then you change your pull request, you, okay. you commit, you push, and, and uh, the pull request have changed, but then the, the update is not done right. in the cache. So it's not just the pipeline library not, not updated in the cache. That's the pull request that we use as a pipeline mm -hmm. library temporarily with the at library common instruction. Right. That right. uh, that that level. to to be clean in the cache, it's right. really it's... on the edge of it. Understood. So yeah, there's two there's two levels to reproducing this. Yeah, I mean that that that's probably that complexity is probably the, re the reason this bug has not been caught in the first place. But if if that can be documented and tested, then I, I think there's there's a solution that could be developed without too much difficulty. It sounds like just yet, yet another if statement or an edge case that could be handled. Yep, that, that's a good tip. Um, Stefan, I think that will be worth an exercise that we do this in pair because uh, since you are you are, you ask to learn more and more about being able to spawn Jenkins instances, that could be a great exercise to produce partial reproduction on a local instance for you. So you will get at ease with how to spin up Jenkins and do ephemeral setups like this one to debug. And uh, that will be a, a worth, worth it investment of these two hours of uh, time. And yeah, it will no, produce it's, something. It's two hours for you, it's two days for me. So we have to mix together to, to lower the, the two days. No problem. Uh, I, the goal is to have a, a valuable investment on the, of that time. And knowledge sharing is always a valuable investment on that area.
Um, yeah. Thanks, well, uh, many thanks for Basil for the tips and jumping in. Do we have other points in, on in the general, CIG? Yeah, in general, with, with newly released features like this, I think it being the first, being one of the early adopters is going to increase the likelihood of encountering these types of bugs. So that's something that you might want to consider as far as the planning goes. If you're if you're going to adopt a new feature, I think that's great. And uh, certainly, it, I mean, if it's released on the update center, then Jenkins users are going to be adopting this feature. So it should work. Um, but there's just an increased likelihood. So if, for example, you know, if you're having a busy sprint and you have a lot of other things to do, it might not be a good time to adopt a new feature. Um, so I'm pointing that out just in case you didn't didn't realize that this pipeline shared library cache was a recent addition. I think it well, it's not very recent, but it was I think it was added um, about six months ago or something like yep. that. Yeah, but so. it's good that we are the one who pinpoint those problems and deal with them. So that's mm -hmm. that's fine. Can I just add something? I would love to know exactly which process you are using to do the flam graph and and all the the bug stuff even if it's not kind of my job i would love to know how you do that sure sure and uh, i would encourage you to do that kind of analysis anytime there's an incident um i uh i could write something down i have um i have written these kinds of runbooks in the past so i'm happy to write one um describing what i did in this case um i saw that mark was referencing some kind of runbook and i don't know what he was referencing but if I can find that, I'll be happy to add some additional, um, some additional description of what I did. Basically, what I did at a high level was I, I downloaded Async Profiler, which is a, an open source Java profiling tool, and um, essentially I ran it on the host. Mark and I ran it together um, because he had access to the box, so we ran this Async Profiler on the host. And what it does is it finds the Java process inside of the container and then collects stack traces every, um, every couple of milliseconds. Um, I think it's every 1000 milliseconds by default or something like that. And you know, what this tool does is collects these stack traces every tick interval, every you know, 1000 milliseconds and does that for a long period of time, like 30 seconds or for two minutes and then sorts the stack traces and creates a visualization of the stack traces that were the hottest during that time period. So that's what we were looking at. And this, this tool covers both Java stack traces as well as native stack traces. Um, so that we were able to see the C++ code in the JVM that was hot, which was the compilation that I mentioned. And this was not relevant yesterday, but we, the tool also shows the kernel side of the stack trace. Um, so for example, if Java code is calling open to read a file, and then the open is you know, calling you know, ext4 lookup to read the file from the ext4 file system, it'll show you that as well. So it's a very useful tool for uh, doing this kind of analysis. And it's, it's not very difficult to set it up and use it. Um, you know, it does require, you need to have things like JVM debug symbols, but our Docker image for Jenkins already has those. So fortunately, we, we had most of what we needed. There are also a few settings you have to uh, change. We had to run sysctl on the box to enable some debugging flag temporarily in the kernel, um, but it's really not too difficult to set it up. And it's, it's usually my first tool when, that I use when I'm dealing with CPU issues. Um, because it, it's a good way of visualizing where the CPU time is going. Perfect. Thank you. I, I need to good. search. I used to have a Docker image that you run as privileged on such a machine when you have the Docker engine that was able to automate all these settings immediately uh, for native things. Uh, for the GVM, GVM part, I never used Flame Graph with GVM, so I don't know. For the uh, for the runbooks, is there uh, is, is there um, a public runbook that I could update, or maybe there's a private one that I could add? Okay. That's a private one. So um, we have private contents. Most of this content should be public, uh, but we haven't had the time. The risk is that there are some personal names, uh, sensitive information hidden somewhere. 
So there is a walk about around uh, uh, extracting the public to private. Okay. Well, I can follow um, up yep. if there's something to update. Uh, I've added, I need to create an issue for the upcoming milestone. Uh, that's part of the, what I call runbook access. That's basically adding you to the private repository and you will have full access. Okay. Thanks. Is there any other point on that area? Should we wait for the, for the post-mortem in order to have more information? And I try to keep track of what we say than uh, having an outcome of what we plan to, to do afterwards as for today. Um, okay, so quickly jumping on the next topic. We were able to finally migrate rating.jenkins.io from the AWS virtual machine into the Kubernetes cluster. The, migra the migration finished this morning by switching the DNS. So it's almost done, but it's still work in progress because we have cleanup actions that are listed on the tickets. We need to put the DNS TTL to something big now, and we need to clean up the virtual machines and the former PostgreSQL database. So thanks for that work, uh, Stefan. Um, we had a minor issue. Uh, Stefan is working on replacing Blotion in default display URL. So we we ask the developers, we are waiting for a feedback from the community if we do it or not. Uh, reminder, it's not removing Blution, it's only changing the default link when you click on a GitHub check or generated link to stay on the classic UI. More people use the classic UI, more feedbacks we can make to the developer and people who are revamping that UI in the upcoming LTS and weekly. Um, that's the equilibria. Uh, the work is done by Stefan as a preparatory work. So if uh, the community say yes, then we can just merge it. That will update the link. Otherwise we close the pool request and we, and we go forward. Uh, Hervé started the work on our ability to build our own Docker Windows images on the infrastructure uh, private controllers. We were only using uh, building Linux images. So that in, in, involves a lot of changes on the pipeline library because we need the pipeline library to be able to handle the PowerShell or BAT command. And we have tooling aspects. We need to find and ensure that each tool we already use on Linux today for the usual Docker build and Docker push workflow, that should work the same on Windows machines. So we are working on that area. Uh, we didn't have time to work on uh, sunsetting mirror brain. Uh, I need to write a blog post on that area, and I had issues with Jenkins IO and the latest Docker for Mac, problem solved. So we can go back on that area next. Um, we have the apply to Docker open source programs that will move out of the milestone now because we are waiting for them to apply the chance so we will benefit the rate limiting. A side note for you, Basil. Um, the rate limiting is one of the root causes that triggered the first outage 12 days ago. It might not be the core of the problems because such events should not break or should not make have some co these consequences. However, it's part of the post-mortem. So I just wanted to mention it aloud. And here we will be sure to have a way more API request limits. If we don't, or if it doesn't work, we are still at risk now. So we have to keep an eye on that area. Uh, finally, one last bug. Uh, after migrating infra report to trusted, the change on the pipeline library involved on that change had a minor impact on the repository permission updater. So I've reopened the issue until the problem is fixed. Um, basically, is that we need to update the virtual machine template we're using for agent. So they have the Azure command line installed. That's almost done. So that's all for the work in progress we have. I don't know if you have other work in progress uh, tasks from the past seven days. One, two, three, okay. So now the, the new or important tasks. So we cover the CI Jenkins IO outages, which is the top priority. Um, we have two new tasks that we need to do uh, this week related to Datadog. 
First one, Datadog announced uh, two or three weeks ago the depreciation of some of the syntax uh, on-call system that was linking Datadog to, to pager duty. And we are using these handles. So we have to use the new pager duty integration. So I haven't checked in details what is the migration path, but that will be just deprecated. So we need to find a solution on that area. Um, and that ad hoc, we need to add the new monitoring I mentioned earlier about the web UI of Artifactory. So we have these two new tasks that are coming on the, on the stack. Um, there have been two other, let's say, long-term elements that are just behind CI.Jenkins.ion priority, but still top priority for the infra. First, a uh, realignment of the repo Jenkins CI org mission. That's a topic started by Daniel Beck a few years ago. We have an issue with GFrog because we are we are costing them quite some amount of money and bandwidth. And the usages done on repo Jenkins CI are not really legitimate. It appears that a lot of external organization are mirroring that repository while they should not. It's, ex it's not expected to be a proxy. Uh, tools and services such as the Maven Central or maybe us having a public uh, proxy system should be used. But here, the initial agreement between the community and GFrog is that they sponsor us so we can use it for CI Jenkins IO and for the developers on direct, for the plugins developers. But clearly the top eaters are artifactories that are in mirror mode from outside. So now we are working with GFrog. We are waiting for them. They are trying to extract a list of the top hitter public IP. So we can start searching DNS name and IP for some people. But um, yeah, we need help, especially from Daniel about the legacy things. There has been a discussion one or two years ago, if I remember correctly, about forcing uh, authentication to be able to retrieve artifact from this one, which is quite a nuclear option because that will, yeah, that will require some, a lot of work and that could have an impact on the contributors because they won't be able to Maven clean install a plugin. They will need to configure their local Maven installation and then do it. So that might create some additional steps for uh, let's say newbie contributors. That was the core of the discussion. I'm just trying to transplant uh, why it wasn't done like this, but that will ensure that we don't have a lot of uh, issue because we had, a lot of performance or outages issues on that service, which is outside our area. And yeah, GFrog is hosting us for free, so we need to find. Um, it's impressive, we have around 20% of the requests made to the repository that are HTTP 404. That's 20%, that's huge. So of course it creates performances issue when these peaks arrive because it uncaches their underlying file system and create a lot of trouble for them. So I don't know what kind of implementation they have. They might have technical solution on their area, but they ask us if we could provide some data or search for the culprits because we are not expected to have so much 404. So there has been different solution. We, I'm not sure if we will have the ability to work next week because we need action item that we don't have right now. But uh, we asked for help for Daniel. So Daniel, we spent some time in the upcoming days to point us on some direction, but that, that's totally worth a discussion to trigger on the mailing list for developers. And one last topic important, uh, I've started working on that. It's migrating the update center to another cloud than AWS uh, because it's costing us 3K per month of bandwidth. And we cannot move easily and fastly. Reason is technically it's easy. The script which is generating the JSON every five minutes can totally uncache fastly immediately, it's one or two seconds. So technically no problem. However, fastly like GFrog is hosting us for free and we will clearly explode the bandwidth they expect to have from us. So the idea is to work with the CDF who are the person or the organization paying for the Jenkins organization to see if we, have, if we can have an hybrid account. So an account where either they, they create a bill and then they remove some part of the bill as part of the partnership, but we still have to pay the additional bandwidth 
but last month it wasn't possible for them to have such an account, which is administrative issue and not technical issue. Alternatively, uh, the idea uh, that Mark and I also added that can be complementary is to move to Oracle because Oracle Cloud has really cheap bandwidth. Like instead of 3K per month, that should be 100, between 100 and 200 with the amount that we have, which could be totally fine. Uh, and additionally, we could benefit some better performances because it's a simple web server serving files and they provide IRM servers, which clearly have a better uh, cost performance benefits than Intel uh, for this specific use case. Uh, so that at least what we saw with other services that we moved from AWS uh, to Oracle without tuning. So with tuning, I'm sure we can do better. But without tuning, without spending too much time, we have very, very nice performances and it's really cheap. So these are the two main topics that are coming priority, keeping in mind that CI Jenkins SIO outages are our top priority for now. Um, one last thing, Hervé did a proposal that I'm mentioning here. It's still an idea that need to be tracked. Uh, that will be splitting the Terraform Azure project in two separated projects. One that handles the network and the DNS and the rest of the infrastructure Azure managed on the actual repository. The goal is the following. The Azure automatic management with Terraform has been stopped by Olivier two or three years ago because there has been a Terraform provider updates that deleted uh, one important DNS and deleted one private network. So we were up that it was not the public network, but that might have an impact. And the, uh, Olivier was alone, he freaked out and stopped the automatic management. So two years uh, later, we have Terraform, we have some archive Terraform that are not up to date. So we are trying to re-go on that area. Problem is that we, we don't want to take the same kind of risk. And so the proposal of Hervé would help us feeling safer adding services database on Azure because we could have two different accounts and the default accounts for most of the infrastructure would not be able to delete the virtual network. They can only read and do the reference to them. So we can add subnets or services inside these networks. And by separating both, then we avoid this kind of issue. So that that's a nice proposal. We will ask Ave when it will be back to formalize that under a nail desk issue. So we can have something uh, written to share, not only already during a meeting like now, uh, for the next uh, weekly meeting. I think I did the tour of what we did. So the next step is as usual, taking all the work in progress items from current milestone to the next milestone, because we still have to work on them, except the Docker that uh, exists. I'm gonna set the priority to the CI Jenkins IO related tasks, post-mortem tomorrow and giving access to Bazel. Um, and then we can close the current issue and start working again. Any question? No, okay. I'm gonna stop the recording. Stop sharing, stop recording.